Welcome to Data Lab. This video will show you the first steps of how to work with Data Lab. Data Lab is based on a very simple data structure, thus enabling you to quickly understand the basics. Data Lab always works on a single two dimensional matrix, assuming the columns to be the variables and the rows to be the observations. Each cell of this P by N matrix contains a floating point number, which represents the particular data point. Further, each cell is provided with an additional status flag, which indicates various states of this cell, such as whether the cell is empty or whether it is marked, etc. In addition to the central data matrix, there are several auxiliary matrices holding, for example, the row and column names, the row and column attributes, and the variable types. Finally, there is a text container which can be used to put a comment on the data set. This data set can now be processed by a large number of commands, most of them being available both within the graphical user interface and within a script language called DLab Pascal. DLab Pascal is a very powerful object-oriented programming language which allows you to process your data by means of programming. In addition to the central data set, Data Lab offers a matrix clipboard which can be used to store intermediate results or auxiliary data. However, any data processing is always applied to the central data set. But for now, we stick to the graphical user interface in order to show you a few important basic features of Data Lab. When we start Data Lab, it loads and shows either the data set used in the previous session or, if starting for the very first time, it simply shows the data matrix survey window. By default, the data matrix is configured to have five columns or variables and 100 rows or objects, thus resulting in a five by 100 matrix with 500 cells all filled with zeros. In order to get a common starting point, we shall load the example data, example a.asc, as a template. Choose the command file load ASC format and select the file example a.asc. This file contains artificial data stored in a table of 100 rows and three columns. The first column holds random values in the range of 0 to 10. The second column holds the cosine of the values of column 1. And the third column holds the square of column 1. A single window the matrix viewer, will appear on the screen which shows a graphical overview of the data and gives access to edit the table. The matrix viewer consists of several tabs, one of them showing the matrix survey plot. Click on the survey tab if it is not already open. This survey plot may look unfamiliar to you, but it is easy to understand. It gives you a bird's eye view of the data in your data matrix. Each value in the matrix is represented by a rectangle whose size is proportional to the value it represents. The rectangles are arranged just in the same way as the numeric values would appear on a printed version of the data matrix. The matrix index runs from top to bottom and from left to right. When moving the mouse over the survey plot, the cell coordinates and the contents of the address cell are displayed. There are a few other tabs which allow you to rename the column and the row names and to add a comment to the data set. In the column tab, you can also specify the types of the variables. Click the edit button to switch into edit mode. Now you can change the variable names and the type of the variables. The same is true for the rows tab, where you can edit the names of the rows and the corresponding class. Although there is a clear relationship between the three columns, we cannot recognize this relationship because the data points in column one are in random order. So let's sort the rows of the data table so that the values in the first column are sorted in ascending order. Click Tools Sort to open the sorting tool. Here you can select different options. So we select column one as the sorting criterion. Set the sort order to ascending and the sort range to the entire data matrix. 
When we click the sort button, the matrix shows now the relationship between the columns. Next, we open a data chart. Either use the menu command Window New or the corresponding shortcut button. The contents of the chart can be changed by using the plot options and the navigation buttons at the left of the chart. The size of the chart can be changed by resizing the chart window. In order to select a particular type of diagram, one has to set up the chart by clicking the Setup button. So, if we select the histogram as the type of plot and the option Column for the data range, we get a histogram displayed showing the distribution of a particular column. Which column to be shown can be selected by clicking the Selector button here, or we can use the arrow keys to switch to neighboring columns. Now, as another example, let us display an XY plot using one column for the x-axis and another for the y-axis. We open a second chart window by clicking this button. Then we select the column column option and select the columns to be used for the axis using the eyedropper button or the arrow buttons. Try to have a look at all possible combinations of the three columns. The data may be displayed using various viewing modes, points, lines, colors, etc., which can be selected by using the plot options. In many situations, it is quite useful to mark part of the data for further special processing. For example, you may want to identify outliers or to change the class properties of some data, or you may want to limit data to a certain extent. All these tasks can be solved by marking the objects in question and performing some further actions on the marked data. Basically, there are several ways to mark data. Markings can be performed either graphically by using the Mark Data button in the diagram windows or numerically by using the Numeric Data Editor. Let's do some practical work in order to show how to mark data graphically. Click the Mark Data button in the XY chart of our previous example. Now you can enter a rectangular area within the data window defining the area where data are to be marked. Note that this marking process behaves like a toggle switch. By marking the same area again, existing markings are removed. This feature can be used to create arbitrarily complex areas for markings. The marked data points are indicated by crosses in the data plots. You may also mark data within the Numeric Data Editor. Click the Edit button in the Data Matrix Viewer. This opens up the Numeric Data Editor, which primarily serves to enter data manually. Marked data are indicated by numbers displayed in different colors, red or blue. You can mark individual ranges of data points by first selecting the corresponding matrix cells and then clicking one of the marking buttons at the top of the editor window. For a detailed description of further options, please refer to the corresponding help page. Now that you have marked some data, you can selectively perform some actions on these marked data. You can, for example, set the marked data to a constant value, apply a formula to the marked data, remove all marked objects from the data table, or assign new class information to these data points. Exploratory data analysis is often guided by additional categorical information on the data. This additional information, often called classes, can be handled by assigning class numbers to the data samples. Data Lab allows up to 127 different categories to be assigned to the data. You can change the data class assignments by editing the class numbers in the Row tab of the Data Matrix Viewer. This class information can be visualized either by using different colors or different symbols. A 
A short example will show how to utilize class information during data interpretation. First, let's load another set of data into Data Lab. Boil points underscore nc dot idt, which consists of 55 objects and 9 variables. This data describes the normal boiling points of 55 chemical compounds and some structural descriptors of these compounds. Some simple descriptors such as the number of oxygen or sulfur atoms, and some more sophisticated descriptors such as topological descriptors which have been deduced from graph theoretical considerations of molecular structures. Now let's have a look at the data and investigate whether there are any relationships between structural parameters and the boiling points of these substances. After loading the file, Data Lab displays two diagram windows, showing the boiling points as a function of the variables Randage Index and Carbon Atoms. The plot of the boiling point versus the number of carbon atoms shows that there is some relationship between them. The more carbon atoms, the higher the boiling points, although the correlation is not too good. Another interesting relationship between the boiling point and the randage index, variable randage ix, becomes evident in the other plot. Here you can see three bands, each of which indicates a strong correlation between the boiling points and the randage index. Of course, one particular question arises immediately. Which property is responsible for the three bands? In order to find this property, you may try to mark one of these bands to begin with and have a look at all the other variables to see whether the markings give any hints as to the origin of these bands. Let's mark, for example, the middle band. Thereafter, we use the other window to browse through all the variables and look for any apparent dependencies. When doing this, you will certainly be startled by the fact that nearly all of the marked objects of the middle band have exactly one sulfur atom. All corresponding markings appear in the one sulfur atom region within the sulfur versus boiling point plot. Thus, we arrive at the hypothesis that the bands in the plot of the boiling point versus randage index are caused by the number of sulfur atoms. In order to verify this, let's now use the concept of class information. We therefore copy the number of sulfur atoms to the class information vector by using the command edit data copy to class information. Select the variable entitled s atoms. Now the class information is copied from the number of sulfur atoms meaning that all substances with no sulfur atoms in them belong to class 0, compounds with one sulfur atom belong to class 1, and so on. The only thing we have yet to do is to activate the color coding of the data in the plot of Randage Index versus Boiling Point. Therefore, open the Setup dialog of this window and select Class Colors in the Attributes field. Now the classes are displayed as colored data points. And look, our hypothesis that the sulfur atoms could be responsible for the three bands in the relationship is verified. And indeed, a far better model for the boiling points of these substances can be obtained by combining the number of sulfur atoms and the Randage index. Some remarks still need to be made on the handling of class information. One. Of course, you can indicate class information not only by different colors, but also by different symbols. This may be important when creating black and white hard copies. 2. You can assign any color or symbol to any of your classes by using the commands setup class assignment colors or setup class assignment symbols. 3. Class numbers can be edited in a batch by utilizing the command edit classes. This brings up the class editor, which provides a multitude of options to adjust the class numbers. Well, that's all for now. In another sequel, I'll give you a basic introduction to various statistical methods available in Data Lab. Stay tuned! Thank <laughs> you.